because what we usually do is we sent we post the recording afterwards for anyone who wasn't able to take any notes or anything. Uh, my name's Tom. I'm the environmental educator at Cleveland Botanical Garden, and your orchid doctor today is going to be Mark Burr. So let me go ahead and make sure that I spotlight his camera so that you know who is talking. Yeah, and I'll just go ahead and turn it right over to Mark. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to Orchid Doctor. Uh, we're going to make this your time this morning, so I would love a lot of questions. You can hold your sick orchid or your healthy orchid up with questions. Uh, so the way this will go, Tom and I will give an introduction to growing orchids, some of the method or uh, pathways to follow with orchids. And then during that and afterwards, we're going to plead for your questions. So uh, we can point out specific things with your plants that will help us uh, learn a, a little bit more about growing these uh, unusual plants. Mark, if you want, you could go ahead and take off your Thank mask. You, and while you're doing that, I'll just let everyone know that um, if you are if you are familiar with the chat box, you can type your questions right in there. Uh, right now, we have so few people that you don't have to. You could just make sure you're unmuted and ask your question out loud. Um, but I think Mark will talk a little bit just to give some people a chance to arrive that haven't yet. A lot of times we have some people that come in a little yeah, late. That's right. Um, and what, if it does get to the point, though, that we have a lot of questions, I'll just know who to ask next or let, ask their question next based on what order you typed your questions into the chat box. So, um, yeah, that's basically all I needed to well, say. About that. Can I ask a question? I don't know if I'm unmuted. You are. Oh, fabulous. Um, unfortunately, I have to leave early, but I'm like dying. I have this question. I, I purchased some orchids at the orchid sale last year. And it brought in these little white bugs that are living on my orchids. And um, this one is really important to me. And I'm wondering how to, how to, how to get rid of them. Well, that's it, a great question and a common problem. Uh, are the, I'll ask you one more part to your question. Are the insects fluffy and squishy or are they really kind of fluffy and squishy? Well, I'm not, I'm not squishing them, but they are like fuzzy <laughs> and they okay. are, and, but it's still flowering. So you can yeah. see it still really is flowering very beautifully, but yeah. it, and I, so every, like every other week I pick them off using a, like an alcohol swab and they come right off, but it leaves this like sticky stuff on the leaves yeah. and on the table. That's uh, they're very common. Mealybugs are uh, uh, common to all gardeners, especially indoors. And then they love orchids. It's a cousin to aphids, so they're sucking insects. They position themselves and don't move and stick their little snouts into the leaves of your orchid and suck out the sap. And then the sticky stuff is uh, the, the uh, remains of their meal that they exude from their skin. And it's, it still has some sugar in it, so it's quite sticky. That's a real diagnostic tip. You can walk around the garden and feel the plants or see the shiny uh, surface of the sticky stuff that's been left behind. You know you've got mealy bug rate. But treatment is uh, get some 91% isopropyl alcohol and dilute it down to 25% with water and do just what you did, dousing it off. Can you uh, say that one more time a little slower? Sure. Sorry. It's, uh, it's full strength isopropyl, rub, what we call rubbing alcohol, yep. but it's a 91%. And then cut it down to 25% with water. So um, three to one. And then, then I just spray. Just what you've been doing, use your um, Q-tip or a soft cloth and uh, dab mm -hmm. the insect. You don't even need to remove them all down in the crevices. The alcohol that itself will kill them. It dries them out and they die. Uh, but for cosmetics, you can clean them up. Method two is and this is what you may need to resort to sometimes because those mealy bugs will get down into the crevices of the plant where we can't reach them. And sometimes they'll even go under the soil on the roots. Mm. But to get some horticultural soap, um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's like regular bath soap, but with all of the emollients and perfumes and carriers and things uh, left out of the mix. It's just a soap extra. And you can buy it concentrated and mix your own uh, for a spray bottle, or you can buy it, buy it pre-mixed. And then you can spray the whole plant with that stuff. Uh, and 
it's just called horticultural safe soap. It's rated uh, for organic gardening by the USDA. Um, so it's not something that's gonna uh, bring poison into your house. We use it all the time here uh, for both biomes and for individual orchids. And can number you- one, Diluted uh, rubbing alcohol and number two, uh, horticultural soap. And can you spray that on the flower? I try not to spray the flower, but you can. Um, okay. make, make sure that it's, it's a, it's a pre-mix or that you've diluted your uh, stock. Um, and, and if I can't get this under control, because it's been about a year now, and I've like, you know, succeeded in killing some, obviously, but it's still going. But I'm still impressed that the flower is still surviving. It's still blooming. Well, the insect, the, the mealybugs aren't going to stress the plant too much if it's just oh. a couple of them, a low population. In okay. fact, integrated pest management uh, tells us that we're allowed to have some of the insects. We just have to control the population. Oh, cool. One thing you can do that might help is move them outside for the summer. Uh, it, there will be natural predators that will come around and help you with your work. Oh, yeah. But don't put them in the sun because the sun will burn the leaves. They've, they've been used okay. to being indoors. So under a shady tree, you can hang it in a little orchid basket uh, and, and take a look at it at least every two weeks and give it a, a refresh, a, a, a yeah. spray or a touch up with your rubbing alcohol. You'll get ahead of the curve. Thank you. That was very good. Good question. Thank you. I'm gonna mute myself. Well, I'm gonna start talking, but I don't consider uh, hands up or saying something uh, in an interruption. I just wanna give us the landscape here. I think the biggest problem everybody, including me have with orchids is that they don't live in places like we have here in Ohio. They certainly don't wanna be outdoors in the winter around here. And they, they really don't wanna be indoors either because they're used to tropical forests uh, where it's warm and humid. And uh, they're also, at least for the orchids we tend to grow, they're tree dwellers. So they live without soil too. So those couple of facts of its, its natural existence make them really difficult to bring in. But in places where they're naturally happy, orchids are as easy to grow as, uh, as uh, Swedish ivy is in our homes or as daisies are in the front yard. Um, so what we try to do is mimic the things that they're missing from home and give them a little micro environment. And the other thing we try to do is pick orchids that are uh, uh, not quite so far away uh, from our um, basic, uh, the basic constraints of the way our home houses are. And I'll get that one out of the way uh, right away. That's why these moth orchids, the uh, Phalaenopsis or grocery store orchids are so common is because they're from a cooler uh, area of tropical wet forest. And so moving them into our houses, they aren't quite as shocked by our temperatures. And it's not a profound rainforest where they come from. So they can tolerate lower humidities in the 40s and 30s. We can limp them through the winter like that. They also uh, have a fairly low light requirement. So a uh, north window, even in an Ohio home, will give them enough light to rebloom. That's number one. N number two is uh, these orchids that get called uh, oncidiums or dancing ladies. I can hold this forward. Oh, okay. the, there's so many hybrids that I'm not going to even try to sort through all the different classes and names but they have sprays of flowers that look more or less like uh, women in long flowing squirts, uh, shirt, uh, skirts, excuse me, dancing. So they get that common name, dancing lady. Um, these, uh, if you have a little higher light uh, and you can give it a little more humidity in the winter, we can also get to bloom successfully. Number three, as a good sample for home growers are these slipper orchids. Um, the Paphiopetalums are slipper orchids, and they're a rule breaker. They actually live uh, uh, terrestrially uh, in Southeast Asia where they go or come from. But like the, the um, Phalaenopsis orchids, these can get by with less humidity, cooler temperatures, uh, and uh, lower light. So these are another good windowsill plant for uh, uh, people like me who have very dry, cool homes. So those are the three that uh, I take home with me. I don't try to push the envelope. I don't have a greenhouse setting. Uh, and those work very well. 
um, will put up with me in my house. Now, an orchid like this one here, this is a dendrobium, and there's uh, 1,500 wild dendrobiums and in, in 100 times that with the hybrids. So I'm not even going to uh, talk about names and types. But the dendrobiums share this one trait where they have bamboo-like stems uh, or pseudobulbs, the, uh, the part we'd call the trunk on these little miniature trees. That's kind of a, a, a diagnostic uh, feature that they all share. But these like it hot, they like it bright, and they also really want a lot of humidity. And all this stuff coming out of here are the, uh, the aerial roots that, that this plant and many orchids grow. In the case of these, the, the, unless you really have a nice humid little bubble for it to live in, the roots die as they grow. So these plants uh, want to struggle uh, for a lot of us. So stay away from those unless you go down the rabbit hole and build yourself a little uh, humidity tent, things like that. So if you have one of those, because I have one of those I purchased last year at the sale, would you like put it outside in the summer? I put all my I put all my orchids outside in the summer. And I'd say do the same for you. It's uh if you put them on the ground, you get worms and slugs and things like that. But if you put them on a picnic table under a, a, a shady tree or hang them in baskets, I have some baskets here. This is a slat basket for growing orchids in. People plant orchids directly in these, but they make a great way to uh, quickly mm -hmm. hang your orchid that drains. And uh, then there's wires and just hang it from a branch. And, and then would you just kind of leave it to its own devices or would you still soak them in water? I'd like still want to check the, uh, the water conditions okay. on it. And I'm, I'm, I, I've said it a couple of times, I'll say it again. Don't put them where there's any sun at all to start with because the leaves will burn. I've done that myself. I just put them out and I get an hour of sun in the afternoon and the leaves are all yellow. In, in a week. So I have a question on burned leaves. Um, yeah. This guy got burned. Um, do I just kind of leave it or is there anything I should do for it? Does it I would just leave those. That's a, a, a phalaenopsis and it's, con yeah. it's going to continue to set new leaves, a few new leaves every year. Okay. Yeah. Cause I got a nice new one right here yeah. after those got burned, but okay. you know, I, I, uh, I recommend you let the new leaves get a little bigger and then you can carefully cut away the spent leaves. And I think it will be okay. Okay. Um, that's the, that leaf, those old leaves are still working. Mm -hmm. uh, they just have burn spots on them from the Okay. Sun. Yeah. And then this guy is um, that orchid you just shown, right? Who likes more. That looks like a dendrobium. Yeah. 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 Cause I, I also got this at last year's orchid sale and it hasn't rebloomed since. And I was kind of thinking, I got the special stuff that's more deserty, you know, more rocks. Um, but I, yeah, I wasn't, I, I've heard like for indoors to give it more humidity, you can do like a bowl of shallow water and put like marbles in it or something. Is that? Yeah, something I, uh, I'll yeah. show you one here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a, a tray filled with uh, gravel. Uh -huh. And uh, I like to use a pretty fine gravel because it has more surface area. So it evaporates uh, more water per hour. And then uh, I'll make a little model here with this tray. I put something in it, an upturned saucer in this case, to hold my orchid above the water level. Um, so its roots can aerate and dry out. It loves the humidity, but it doesn't like standing in a puddle. Uh, so that's the important part of doing this. You don't then have to be around, of course, uh, but uh, it's a great way to humidify our orchids. It really works. And it will help those moth orchids or the phalaenopsis we're talking about, as well as the fancier orchids. You know, all the orchids we grow in our house would like it more humid than our houses are in the winter. But the three that I called out will put up with our, our dry air. So if you take this plant that loves dry air and puts it on a humidity tray, it's going to be more of a show worthy plant and it's going to be happier and more likely to bloom really vigorously each year. Got it. you hold that up one more time? I want to take a picture sure, of that. Sure. Great idea. <laughs> Thank you. This is just a model. Uh, you can make yeah. a long tray full of pebbles and then put a row of orchids 
uh, on it. Uh, this is just what I had handy to throw something together. At home, I have a, uh, a shelf right next to one of my windows, and I, I have just that. I have a long tray with the, the pebbles, and then my orchids rode out on upturned pots. They love it. For the orchid to this white or yellow one, I'm trying to think if it's, I think to your right, um, with the very thin leaves right there, is that a terrestrial orchid? That is. Uh, plants break all the rules, and 99.9% .9 of the tropical orchids we grow in our homes are aerial. They're epiphytic plants. But ones like this, this is a symbibium uh, or a boat orchid. That one, and then the, uh, the um, flipper orchid we talked about earlier are two terrestrial tropical orchids. This one's a really intriguing plant for some of us because it's, uh, it's uh, from a part of Asia that uh, gets cool nights, so it's uh, subtropical. To get this one to bloom, we treat it like uh, the holiday cactus, if you grow those. Uh, it likes to have cool nights for about eight weeks every autumn. I haven't grown one of these for a while, um, but I used to leave it on my screened porch until the first heavy frost, and that's the night I'd take it in. By then it set new flower buds and it would bloom for me in the winter. So they can take a cold house. Uh, they like humidity, but they are another plant that uh, do okay without as much in the winter. But they have to have those, those series of cold nights to bloom. So that's Got it. And they're big. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got one of those at last year's orchid sale right. and just doing kind of sad because I, I, you know, I learned how to take care of the other guys and then I'm like, oh, this one's super yeah. different. Um, mm -hmm. So it's that's a good one. To... Plants, uh, ask all the basic questions that you'd ask any house plant, but we ask them with more emphasis with orchids because of that notion that they aren't built to handle our lifestyles up here in Cleveland. So ask about light, ask about water and humidity, ask about the day length and light intensity, and ask about temperature. And those are several asks, you can find the answers to all those at the American Orchid Society website, aos.org. Is there a specific kind of gravel you would get to make that tray? Uh, you know, I'd get anything, don't get limestone because that will uh, 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 cause an alkaline reaction with the water. I just buy some uh, pea gravel, lightweight uh, or light uh, Gra granite gravel. Of course, gritty sand is okay too. It tends to get mucky, but uh, the, if you don't use big pebbles because they, the surface area is lower, so they don't evaporate water as quickly. Don't use what? Do not use big pebbles. Oh, big. All Sorry. pebbles, the size of smaller than peas. Uh, you should be able to get this at a, at a Home Depot or a, uh, a um, garden center. I buy it by the yard. <laughs> and so I have a big supply of it here right now, but you can buy, you should be able to buy small bags of that. Thank you. For this terrestrial orchid, would you recommend putting it outside now even where it's, you know, I know it's 70 and 80 right now, and then it's Cleveland, so it'll probably go down to 50. Or should I wait until summer and then leave it uh, out? I'd wait until summer for safety. Okay. Just so you can control the frost cycle. Yeah. And that American Orchid Society, it has drop down care sheets, one page care sheets for all these classes of orchids that we're talking about, anything you're likely to find. Awesome. Uh, can I ask Kate, how did your orchid burn its leaves? You know, I had it at a window, but I also have a lot of like um, glass fixtures. And so I think uh, the sun hit the glass and magnified it and then just like burned the crap out of the leaves. <laughs> I've since moved it from that area. <laughs> it doesn't take much. It just, it yeah. can, you know, I did the same thing. I moved my plant and it got a little bit of direct sun for an afternoon and that was it. Mm -hmm. Yep, happened to me multiple times too. Yeah. <laughs> With that symbidium, do you use a humidity tray for that? It would it be like the same concept, just you know. It, it helps keep the leaves in better shape. Okay. It, it, it's, it's just so much bigger and tray, higher. What trays do is they help flowers from uh, uh, the buds will will 
fail if uh, sometimes if they open in a space that's too dry. Mm. So at least for the beginning of the bloom cycle, I'd make sure to keep that plant humid. Okay. And I know it's big and how do you make a big tray for that, but you can spray it a couple times a day with a, sp a spray bottle and uh, some distilled water in it. Okay. For Phalaenopsis orchids, um, I was kind of confused trying to do some online research on when you cut the stems, because it was kind of like, hey, it might grow back, it might not. Yeah. I, and I've kind of noticed with mine, like I, one of my girlfriends a few years ago, she had cut some of mine and some of them grew back great. And some of them, I haven't gotten another stem since. Is it crapshoot or do you have advice? On that? <laughs> it's, uh, it's like horse races. It's the opinion that makes the race. <laughs> Horticulture is that way. You're going to get three ways to do everything. Got uh, it. But let me explain the logic that supports what way you choose to do it with. This is still blooming. Of course, we don't prune it now. The first way to handle this is to let it go fully out of bloom and to let the spent flower stems turn the color of straw and then cut them out, cut them off low, just above one of the joints. There's several joints on that stem or node, just above one of those. And, uh, and then th that plant has no stems left, just green leaves. It will grow for a year and, uh, and set really strong uh, flower stems for next year. Got it. So, so like my, before, go ahead. So I'd, I'd cut this guy right there. Yeah. So I, you so, know, a little, maybe I could have done, gone closer to that node. And then I just leave this um, yes. as is, and then it'll be another stem elsewhere potentially. Yeah, it, it will go through a, a rest period and then uh, early summer or mid summer, it'll start growing vigorously. And probably in September, October, you'll start seeing it setting up a new spike or flower stem. And then this guy, cause like then he has another spike and this is, you know, I have like a really, uh, yeah, I like it's still it. green on the end. So this is mm -hmm. still, it'll probably, maybe it'll blue, maybe I'll get some buds. I just let it do its thing. Well, how long has that been standing? Like that, um, no flowers? You know, I think I got flowers in probably on this guy. I want to say maybe like five months ago or something. Okay. You know what? If that one's deciding to live on, you may get a rebloom on that stock, or you may get small plantlets that will form at those joints that you can okay. grow forward and propagate. That's version two is to let the stocks stand and then you get some reblooms. And okay. maybe even a, the gift of a, a fresh little plantlet that you can cut and transplant. The problem with that, okay, is that it's discouraging the plant from sending up strong, fresh flower mm -hmm. spikes for next year. Mm -hmm. You may get a series of wheat blooms over the next couple of years if you leave that. Got so, it. That's, yes. Sorry, Samantha, just one quick. Oh, side. yeah, no, no. So, because like I know some of my failing analysis have gotten, they're just super long at this point. You know, they're like, yeah. crazy long so I just wait until a couple still flowers but when those die if I cut it then it kind of gives it that re rejuvenation of energy to have stronger blooms and then I'll have a shorter set. like I won't have this six foot long orchid you know, let's cut them right <laughs> off the, the letting it go to the color of straw is the classic uh, okay device but you can cut them as soon as they're done blooming and they'll still heal because we're entering the the uh, season where it'll be growing okay I cut mine off as soon as the flowers are really spent. Um, Got it. And so, so to put it in simple terms, done flowering, cut them both off, or done flowering, let them stay and see if you get a little rebloom and a couple of baby plants. But that's more uh, if you have, uh, if you want to play around, it's pretty much guaranteeing you won't get a strong bloom next year. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. So I, I have to go. I cannot thank you enough. This has been so helpful, but I do have one of those little sprouts. It's like this big. Do yes, I just yes. pick it off and what do I do with it? Let it grow a little more. It'll get a little bit bigger. And then you can carefully remove it from the, the stalk and uh, pot it up. Uh, okay. I would pot it, let me show you here. You know, orchids grow, most orchids we're growing are growing in bark chips. Yep, that's uh, what my Yep. But little orchids we grow in, in oh, moss. Okay. And we'll awesome. hold water a little longer. Send me a picture of it when you think it's ready. 
a digital picture on, to my email and we can talk about it then, or you can just stop in. I can't oh, okay. your name, I'm sorry. Well, thank you so much. Kate, he's all yours, the expert. <laughs> okay. Stop at any time. We, I'm glad to talk about this in person. Thank you so much, Tom. <laughs> all right. Well, let's see. There's just the two of us, three of us, Tom. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, let me give you a couple of highlights on how to get orchids to rebloom. Yeah, that'd be awesome. The biggest thing that we all uh, don't don't do that in to keep our orchids from blooming is to not give them a temperature change between day and night. And this is where those orchid society care sheets will tell you the temperature range. But rule of thumb is five to 10 degrees difference between day temperatures and night temperatures. In my house, I do that by putting it next to one of my crummy windows because they get cooler at night. And that certainly in the eight weeks before the orchid's scheduled to bloom, that day night temperature difference helps the orchid decide it's time to bloom. So that's a big deal with orchids. And it has to be for like a certain Eight to 10 weeks for a lot of plants do this. Christmas cactus, uh, uh, most plants in Ohio need a day length change mm -hmm. um, and a temperature change, uh, the day to night difference. So I don't think you have to pay attention to it now, but say Labor Day, start thinking about giving your uh, autumn and winter blooming orchids that, that day night temperature change. And it can, for me, it's simple. I put them on the back porch or I put them next to this crummy window and they, they get cooler at night. The second thing is the amount of light. Most of the orchids aren't too picky about the length of day. They are in the wild, but we can cover that range uh, with normal sunlight in all but some of the more uh, um, specialized orchids. But the intensity of the light is a big deal too. Now, obviously you've, you've startled that Phalaenopsis because they're a low light orchid, but they can get too little light and they, they have a way of telling us gardeners when they're getting the right amount of light. This orchid here has been professionally grown by Green Circle and it's a, the camera dims it a little bit, but it's a nice bright grassy green. Uh, if this leaf starts getting darker, maybe the color of a hemlock or a, a pine tree, that leaf is telling us, well, I'm not getting enough light. So if your orchid gets dark, it's not getting enough light. Got it. If it gets without looking burned, but if the leaves start to get yellowish, it uh, may be getting too much light. Right in between, like the like the uh, fairy tale or the fable, there's a just right point, uh, and that's when these leaves are bright grassy green, and the margins have a little bit of red on them, nice rosy red. That's maximum light, but not too much. That's the sweet spot, and commercial growers uh, do that with uh, light meters and things. But and so their plants all come in with those red edges. But if it's grassy green and uh, you get the night temperatures cooler for 10 weeks in the autumn, you're going to get flowers every year on your plant. Trying to determine if mine look grassy green or not. <laughs> I know it's hard over. It's, it's like it does the color. I can't say, but I'm guessing it, they're glossy. So they look, I'm guessing they're in good shape. OK. Yeah. Do you uh, have more than one of those? You can try moving them around, try them in a different window and see if they brighten up. Okay. Um, what about fertilization? Like, Ooh, is that what you're gonna say? For what? Fertilization. You know what, that's, that is a good question that I've had. Um, yeah. What, what's kind of the rule of thumb? You know, I, I have like a little orchid spray I've used before, um, yeah. but then, you know, I've. I, definitely, I, I don't grow a ton of plants. I've kind of just jumped in with orchids. Yeah. Um, kind of what I've read is you you want to slow that down in the winter and then pick it more up when they would be blooming anyways. Definitely your take would be appreciated. Yeah, a rule of thumb is uh, to fertilize orchids weekly and weekly. That's not my 
line, but uh, it, it uses uh, WEAK and WEEK together because it should be fertilized on a regular basis, but with, uh, without giving it too much at any one time. The way I do that is I, um, I mix a very dilute solution of fertilizer and I dip my orchids in there when I water them. Got it. It doesn't have to be weekly. Me, I do it every second or third week during the growing season, which is now. And then after the orchid blooms, whenever that is with your orchid, I give it a break for a month or two months. I don't fertilize it. it, uh, it that's pretty standard with, uh, with just about any plant that's bloomed. We give it a break because it's uh, recovering uh, or resting for that month or six weeks after the bloom. Got it. As far as what kind of fertilizer to use, you can buy fancy fertilizer. Um, I've always used just standard uh, 20, 20, 20, or a, a standard mix of general fertilizer, general purpose fertilizer. Okay. Uh, it's, it's easy to find and inexpensive that way. And a lot of growers use that too. So as long as you do it on a regular basis, that will give the plant everything it needs. If you have a cherished orchid or you want to get fancy, you can buy orchid special fertilizers, which have the big three nutrients plus minors in the right amounts for orchids. The big three are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, and the minors are other things, copper, iron, all kinds of things that the orchid may need in very minute amounts. So if you're spending 30, 40, 50 dollars a pop for orchids, which is easy to do, you might want to spend 15 bucks for a bag of orchid special fertilizer. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's your decision. That sounds like me. <laughs> I mean, I think of um, right before blooming as a time too, if I don't fertilize it all the time, what do you yeah. think about that? Does that kind of give it a boost or help trigger it if it hasn't? I don't hand? think too much about it. I okay. water it up through bloom, or okay. excuse me, I, I fertilize it up through the bloom. So my orchids get about 10 and a half or 11 months of fertilizer a year. Okay. That makes sense because then you know it's going to have yeah. all the nutrients that yeah. it needs. Yeah, depending on your light source, uh, especially in the autumn when we, our days are losing uh, daylight hours, uh, you can cut back on the fertilizer a little bit uh, because the plant isn't getting, doesn't grow as actively if it's not getting as much light. The other thing to do with orchids or any plant with fertilizing is to flush them occasionally. So you can put it on a schedule, do it once a month, at least every other month. Um, run tepid water through the plant with no fertilizer. Uh, and really thoroughly drain the pot for five or 10 minutes, flush that through. That'll get all the dissolved salt out of that orchid. The stuff that's good for a plant in small amounts when it's dissolved in uh, fertilizer water is bad for plants when it takes on uh, the tender root tissues and stem tissues. It'll actually burn the plant. Yeah, because the plant only uses what it needs and then the rest just kind of... Yeah. So that's one reason I, I don't fertilize every week. Uh, it gives me, it keeps me ahead of the ball a little bit with uh, that flushing. You know, you can write down rules that work for you. You sound like you're, you're really uh, caring well for your plants and mm -hmm. you're watching them and learning from them. Come up with a system that's simple for you and works that gets the plant fertilized on a regular basis. Um, and then up through the bloom cycle. And uh, don't forget to flush it occasionally to uh, clean up okay. the leaves and the bark. And then it also sounds like she's successfully kept some for a while, like maybe a number of years. And so yeah. what about suggestions on when to repot? That's a great question, oh, yeah. Tom. Uh, and if you get your orchid to rebloom, you're doing everything right. But there's one more thing to do right, and that's to repot the orchid occasionally. Uh, I had heard like every two years. That's that... a pretty good rule. It doesn't have to be every two years, but what we need to do is look at the stuff it's growing in. And since most of our orchids grow in bark like this, these are, are nice pieces, chunks of uh, tumbled fir bark, and they're, they're 
the hard surface and uh, and not at all leathery. They're little chips of wood. They break down over the course of a few years, naturally decompose, and they turn more like humus or soil with every water. When they get humusy uh, and, and lose some of their woodiness, they hold water longer uh, against the orchid roots. And that is uh, bad news for orchids. It, it damages the roots and kills them. And then the plant starts to wilt because it's losing roots and we think it's thirsty. So we start watering it more and that just hastens the death. Um, so repot on need, but if you like to schedule every other year, it makes great sense. And when okay. it's well done blooming, it's time to repot um, during that rest part where we're not fertilizing. Chips, there's, there's, there's all different kinds of size uh, bark chips that we can use. Pick one that's appropriate to the size of the plant. It's, it's that kind of rough and ready sliding scale. Something big, these get bigger chips on this uh, big plant or a big catley orchid. Smaller things get medium chips and really little guys get tiny chips or even moss. Okay. One thing that I thought was interesting that you guys say when you are repotting is that you can actually bury those aerial roots that have been growing out um, so they don't have to be sticking out in the air and yeah let's pull out our uh, trusty uh, moth orchid again all these roots are the color of pale green styrofoam that's kind of what they look like and when they're healthy they're spongy and uh, and look alive when they start to shrivel and die it's because they spent too much time in the dry air and the tips of them dry off and that's quite normal in Ohio. It's not going to kill the plant. If you have a really nice humidity regimen, those roots will stay healthy and look like little green snakes crawling around in the air. But when we repot this, they can be, some of them can be gently tucked back into the soil medium. And uh, you don't have to do that, but you sure can. And then if the tips dry, I saw you just snipped them. Should, is that something you do too? You don't have to do that. Uh, I like cutting dead tissue off. I resist cleaning it back to where I cut live tissue because then that's another wound the plant has to heal. Got it. Okay. It's, it's just cosmetic. Uh, so repotting this with the moth orchids, they grow vertically. They add a new step of leaves each year. Uh, these Rarely do we need to go up in a pot size. We're just re replacing the worn out bark uh, in the same size pot. And it'll tell you when it's too big for the pot you have. But remember with orchids, the pots are more for us humans to have something to hold the orchid with. Right. Manage our irrigation than for the orchids use. Because this thing lives up on a tree, tree branch in the wild. Now some orchids get, uh, let me find one here for this. This uh, uh, dancing lady or oncidium type here grows not taller, but it grows out sideways and will make a big mass. It can be really cool to have a big specimen like that. But each of these blades or flattened areas, I'll turn it sideways here. Each of those is a year's growth. So it blooms and then sets a, a couple more of these flat pseudobulbs they're called, and gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger in girth. As that goes, you can decide to divide that plant every few years and get more little plants, or you can just put it in a bigger container as you go forward. This plant, if uh, 10 or 12 years from now, will fill this basket and will send up dozens of fronds, uh, wow. fronds each year. That's a pretty fun thing to do if you have the, the knack and the space to grow something like that. Yeah, right. yeah, I need, I don't have any of that kind. I'd like to grab one of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that can be fun too, but if you do repot as you're going, don't go from this size to this size pot right away. A lot like with our more familiar house plants, but with orchids, they really like to be under potted. So really resist okay. going bigger unless the plant's telling you. And these kind of orchids that make, that grow sideways, will start spilling out the pot. They'll tell you when it's time. Okay. Yeah.
talked about fertilizer. We talked Oops, about. Uh, we've talked about bugs a little bit. The mm -hmm. stuff we said at the beginning applies to almost any bug we get on orchids. Mm -hmm. Scale insects are a, it's, it's an unintended pun. Are a real bugaboo for me <laughs> with orchids. They're like little limpets. They're insects that live in place on the orchid, and they're like uh, a little hubcap or a limpet, and uh, so they're not susceptible to organic sprays like the uh, horticultural soap. They look to me like um, when you get one of those pieces of popcorn stuck on your tooth and yeah. it's like the shell <laughs> of the kernel. That's a gruesome <laughs> but accurate uh, analogy now. Thank you for that. <laughs> and they're tiny and that limpet, uh, the ones we see are the females and uh, the male crawls underneath that shell and then the babies that are called crawlers come out and crawl all over your beautiful orchid and set up shop all over the leaves and even the flower stem. Oh, wow. So I've been lucky. Say, I really haven't run into bugs. Yeah. Uh, One way you can keep away from these because they don't fly and they can only crawl uh, a few inches is to, whenever you bring home a new plant, keep it in its own space mm -hmm. for a month or two and really look at it. Uh, okay. And then if it's clean, you know, you can bring it into the general population. Okay, that's good. So let's not talk that. about scale anymore. If you get it, you know, stop in and ask me or send me an email about it. Okay. But in general, uh, keeping good air circulation and, uh, and uh, light requirements, general cultural requirements will discourage uh, bacterial and fungal infections. And insects, although they're kind of affected like with orchids, uh, some sequestering when we bring new orchids home goes a long way to minimizing our uh, insect problem. So I have Perfect. a question that kind of just came up in my mind right now. What would be some good partner plants, like companion plants with orchids, if you wanted to repot them along with something else or something like that? That's an interesting question, Tom. I would pot my orchids alone, mm -hmm. uh, singly. Uh, or grouping orchids together, like we we're talking about with those um, with these baskets and, and having a specimen orchid. Mm -hmm. A plant that grows really nicely with some of the higher light orchids are air plants, the Tillandsias and Bromeliads. Okay. They like to get sprayed every day. If you don't know what those are, Kate, they're um, vase-like plants that live up on the tree branches along with the orchids. They're another epiphyte. Uh, okay. We have tons of them here in our Costa Rica biome. Yeah, they're all Got over in Costa Rica. The only challenge in mixing and matching those is that they are a highlight plants almost uh, to a party. They're, um, everyone I can think of is a, is a highlight species. So for instance, I wouldn't grow an air plant with this low light orchid or your your moth orchid. But if you're jumping into higher light plants like the, the um, um, dancing ladies, the oncidium types, or even the dendrobiums, yeah, that would make a great uh, partner plant. With the moth orchids and these low light plants, all of the plants in the African violet family would be lovely company. Oh. And I, uh, I'm going to tell a lie now, Tom. <laughs> yeah, don't give a bad liar. And I brought this along so we could see one. This is a uh, African violet cousin called um, lipstick plant, and it's a lovely plant to grow, and it makes a great partner visually and uh, culturally for some of these low light orchids we're growing. These are trailers too, so you can hang these above your orchids. They can help uh, uh, manage your little humidity bubble you've built around the orchids growing underneath. Oh, very that's, cool. That's a nice choice. And there's so many uh, African violet cousins that you can pick from liliput plants to uh, monsters. I like that because I know that African violets do well in, in the type of house that I live in, so it won't be too hard to take care of that so either. You could grow these. And no okay. Yeah. yeah, just in separate pots. Yes. Yeah, it just makes them easier to care for. Yeah. Okay, because the soil medium is probably more of a soil for the violet. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Although these are terrestrial orchids, for instance, they grow uh, in very loose, uh, mm -hmm. mossy uh, situations on the forest floor in Southeast Asia. I love that, though. That would be cool to be able to have to have another plant that grew right in the same 
pot with that with an orchid well, like you that. You could do it, Tom. You could put a pot in pot with these. You could mm -hmm. plant that guy in a in a pot, and then this could nestle in the corner and mm -hmm. look. You could treat them as separately. Yeah, and I would still have color at times when, yeah. um, when maybe the and for both of us, let someone I else do, in uh, who's in the waiting room. Very often in displays at the garden where I want to put different plants in the same setting, I'll do a pot and pot. This I'll have one pot set down in the soil mm -hmm. or in the pot. I'll use this here like that, and then I have this as a duplicate of the same pot that nestles in that, so it's easy to keep care. Um, protocols discrete and separate between each plant. And then when I want to work on this one, I take it out. In mm -hmm. the Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Because now it's like a pop it in, pop it out. Yeah, exactly. That's a lot of fun to grow plants <laughs> like that, make little tableaus. Uh, with yeah, that. it's like kind of a modular thing. You could have a bunch of those and like maybe you want this pilot in with this working on this. Day. Just Be careful what you say. You're going to have a class modular, <laughs> modular for gardening. <laughs> We've got a new uh, guest with us. So just okay. to catch you up on what's going on, it looks like your name might be Thea or Tia. Um, you can, if you have a question about your orchid, it's okay to turn on your video and show us. Um, otherwise you can just ask questions out loud. You don't have to type them into the chat box or anything. I think since this is the last one and we're, uh, mm -hmm. that a lot of people rushed to make sure that they got their orchid questions in some of the earlier weeks. So you have uh, full rain over Mark today. <laughs> good morning, Thea. I, I, good morning. I apologize. I had a church meeting this morning. It, com, big conflict. Anyway, my, you know, my, I don't have any of my orchids here at home. They're all in my office. Uh, it drives people nuts, but I don't care. Uh, good for you. <laughs> I have a dozen of them in my window. Anyway, um, the the thing I'm asking, is there something I should be feeding them? Because they're blooming, you know, regularly, but uh, is there something I really, you know, and I tried something over the counter kind of thing mm -hmm. and it seemed to not do well for them. Okay, good question. And since your orchids are re-blooming for you, I'm gonna cut right to the chase with this. Don't change what you're doing as far as light and humidity and irrigation. You must be doing something right if they're blooming. As far as fertilizing, I recommend a general purpose fertilizer, equally balanced, over the counter, the cheap stuff at a garden center, and then using it very dilutely uh, every other time you water the orchid. Oh. And Thea, every fourth time you water the orchid, use clear water and flush it through. Don't just water it, run the water through the pot for a few minutes to get rid of all the dissolved uh, fertilizer that's that's gathered on the roots and the potting soil, the potting media. Number one, a, a general uh, quality fertilizer that you put on very dilutely, uh, say every other week. And then number two, once a month, flush water through that pot, do it in the sink or soak it in a bucket for a while, but you wanna wash things off and through the pot. And that should give you success as far as fertilizing goes. We often okay. want to fertilize our orchids too much. They like fertilizer, but they like it in to sip at it. Weak, weak solutions. Okay, that's what I did wrong because I used it as uh, I it was too potent. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So read the label. If it says make it two tablespoons to a gallon, make it half a tablespoon to a gallon. That that will do your orchid more service than giving it too much. It's okay, like and the other thing, COVID, we eat too much. We should be eating too little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the only other question I had was about uh, leaves that I have one that looks like it's shriveling up. Yeah. What am I doing wrong there? I, that, that could be a lot of things, but the first thing I check would be the the roots. Uh, a lot of times, orchids, if they've been in the same pot for a, a year or two. The bark that they're grown in breaks down and it gets more like soil than like bark chunk. It holds water okay. longer and the roots die. So, and then when roots die, what happens? The plant can't take in any water. So it looks like we're not watering it enough when in fact it's had water, gotcha. too much water. That's why so I need to, re I need to repot it then. I'm sorry? 
I need to repot it then. Yes, yes. Take it out. Uh, if the roots all look spongy and brightly colored or white, it's healthy. If some of the roots are brown or turned wiry and soft, then it's really telling you to, to put it in fresh bark and start again. Okay. Yeah, that's the, this is not me making up a fact. It's the American Orchid Society says we kill more orchids by overwatering them uh, when we let the bark break down in the pots. Uh, so repotting your orchids, uh, when they reach that point, it is good horticulture for you to perform. Excellent, excellent. Well, I have my questions answered. <laughs> well, great, Tia. And Wonderful. you know what? Uh, we're uh, anytime you want to send a digital photograph of a problem uh, to the horticulture staff here, we'll take a look at it and get back to you. Uh, or you can stop in with your plant. Uh, and uh, one of us, uh, there's seven horticulturists here. We can look at your problem with you. Oh, I didn't know that. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're here to help. All right. All right. Well, anyone, anything else? Anyone? It's just the three of us. It's now. just the three of us now. Yes. So um, there's about seven minutes left if we want to hang on, um, but it's up to you. I'll leave that up to you, Mark. Do you have any other problems with your plant, Thea? No, I, you know, um, I, I, I actually, I, I think because I, I let the water run through it, like you mm -hmm. said, yeah. Because yeah. I, I was never. Um, um, successful with the with the uh, ice cubes no that's that's a great way to describe how to water plants but they like warmer water and uh you know a big flush uh once a month is something that an ice cube can't do so uh, exactly yeah. and and that's why they did not do well for me <laughs> right, right yeah and i do i do like to imagine i'm on a tree and how that would be like as far as how the water would actually happen, it just kind of just washes over it and it yeah. doesn't sit in any water. So that's exactly right, Tom. Mm -hmm. These orchids were growing, come from tropical forests and they live up in the trees, not down in the soil. So their requirements are very different and we just have to mimic those. Pia, if you Ex get online and go to the American Orchid Society, AOS.org, they, uh -huh. they have clear drop down care sheets for all the orchids that we're growing. I'm guessing you have uh, some of these moth orchids, the grocery store orchids. They'll have a yeah, I sheet. have those, yeah. They'll have a care sheet for that. If you're growing slipper orchids, they'll have care sheets for that. Uh, if you're growing anything, little miniature dendrobiums, they have care sheets. And the neat thing about those sheets is they're all in the same order. They, they talk about light, temperature, water, fertilization, and pruning all in order. So every sheet looks the same, but with the specifics for the orchids in front of us that we're working with. I use them all the time because I'm not going to pretend to know how to keep track of the 40,000 or so orchids on this planet. So I go to outside help uh, all the time. Well, I'm hoping to, uh, I'm coming to the sale. So I'm hoping to get okay. a few different kinds okay. of Well, I'll orchids. be there. You may see me. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me some questions, oh, Thea. Oh, oh, good, good. I get the chance to meet you face to face. All oh, right, good. Uh, all right. Thank, well, thank you so you. very much. You're very welcome. Well, okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Let's. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you say we wrap it up? Yeah, we could sign off. Thank done. you, Thea. Hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye now. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the recording.